Andrew Murray wrote, May not a single moment of my life be spent outside of the light and love and joy of God's presence. And not a moment without the entire surrender of myself as a vessel for him to fill full of his Holy Spirit and his love. I love reading about old preachers like Andrew Murray and Charles Finney and, and Moody. Because they spoke and talked about experiencing the filling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Last week we were talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, or pneumatology. We talked about baptism and other things the Holy Spirit does for us at the moment of salvation. Today we want to talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to live the Christian life, or to please God, or to worship Him, or to discover His will, or to be Christ-like, or anything else in the Christian life apart from the power and work and filling of the Holy Spirit. We talked last week about the fact that a lot of people think a lot of strange things about the Holy Spirit. What's worse than thinking strange things about the Holy Spirit is neglecting Him altogether. It's dangerous to neglect what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit, to ignore the Holy Spirit's work in your life. If you're in here and you're not a believer, the great danger for you is to neglect the drawing of the Holy Spirit to Christ in regards to your salvation. If you're in here and you've never been saved and you've ignored the pulling, the drawing, the speaking of the Holy Spirit to your heart regarding your need to be saved, you're committing a very serious and dangerous sin that may have eternal consequences. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit in your life. Christian, Baptists, in our circles, the danger is the neglect of the Holy Spirit. We have a tendency to talk a lot about the Father and to talk a lot about the Son and ignore the Holy Spirit altogether. He's barely even mentioned as a byword. You, in order to carry out God's will for your life, to understanding anything about what your salvation is about, must understand what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. If you feel like you're a blank slate right now, getting ready to be written on, I want you to know that, that you have been missing an incredible part of your faith, an incredible part of salvation. God invites you into it. He invites you. He desires for you to understand the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants that for you. D.L. Moody, a great preacher in Chicago in the 1800s, when he was a teenager, was listening to a preacher talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit. And the preacher said this, he said, The world has yet to see what God can do with a man who is completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And Moody says, Why has the world yet to see that? I'll be that man. And he that day, and for the rest of his life, lived a life being filled with the Spirit, being used by God, and God used him to convert countless, countless souls to Christ, simply because he surrendered himself, he submitted himself to the Holy Spirit's filling. Some facts before we go on into the main body here. We talked about baptism last week. When you get saved, you get baptized by the Holy Spirit. Go on on your PowerPoint and on your outline here. Some facts, baptism versus the filling. Because a lot of Christians, a lot of people in different churches too, and Baptists probably also, get these things confused. And you must not get confused about the difference between these two things because you'll, you'll go off into doctrinal error. You don't want to get off into error. All right? There's some teach, some, uh, There's just all kinds of different weird teachings about the Holy Spirit that are not biblical. We need to stay in the Bible. Here's the differences between baptism and and filling. Baptism occurs one time. It occurs once at salvation. Filling is something that's repeated and continual. It's repeated and continual. The Bible says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the verb tense means to, to continually, ongoingly be filled. So there's a continuation, there's a repeating process. 
we get empty pretty easy. And God needs to fill us. Baptism cannot be undone. You cannot undo your baptism. Romans chapter 8 says, What can separate us from the love of Christ? Neither height nor depth nor powers nor any created thing can separate you from the love of Christ. Why? Because when you got saved, God made you to be His. He saved you. The work of salvation was God's work. It wasn't you. You couldn't save yourself. And when He saved you, He marked you and He sealed you by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. He baptized you. You were washed in the blood of Christ and marked with the Holy Spirit. You belong to Him. It can't be undone. That also means that every sin we commit, every time we ignore our conscience and what the Holy Spirit is telling us, we're dragging God through that. We're dragging God through it. The filling, though, is something that can be lost. You can lose the filling of the Spirit mainly due to disobedience. We'll get into that a little bit more. Baptism is true of all believers. Every believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says if you don't have the Holy Spirit, that you're not even a Christian. Now, you may not understand the fullness of the Spirit and all the things the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life, but if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to God. He knows who's His. So let me ask you, do you know you're his tonight? Do you know he lives inside of you? I hope you do. On the filling, though, the filling is not true of all believers. Not all believers live a life filled with the Holy Spirit, seeking to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Not all believers do that. Baptism results in justification. Justification. When you got baptized by the Holy Spirit... Your position before God changed. God used to see you as a dirty, rotten sinner. Now, God sees the blood of Jesus Christ covering your sins. You've been made clean and justified. God the Father has brought the gavel down and declared you innocent because Jesus Christ gave you His righteousness. You're declared innocent. You have no fear of judgment, of hell, of death. Because he's declared you innocent. He's justified you. Filling results in power. It results in power. God saved you in order for you to know him and walk with him and be used by him. You and I need power to accomplish the things God wants us to accomplish in this life. In order for you to be the person God wants you to be, you need power. You can't accomplish anything for God on your own. It's all His power. Trying to live your life not being filled with the Holy Spirit is like driving around in a car that had the motor stolen out of it. It's impossible to do. The Holy Spirit is the power in our life. He isn't just a power, though. We talked about last week the Holy Spirit is a person. He's God. but He lives inside of you and He gives power. The next is this on baptism. The prerequisite for for baptism is salvation. You get saved and baptized and the Holy Spirit, he, he baptizes you. The prerequisite for being filled is yielding. It's yielding to the Holy Spirit. It's stopping and giving Him control of every situation in your life, of every behavior in your life, of every plan and thought in your life. It's yielding to Him. Like when you're pulling up onto the freeway and you're getting on the on-ramp, And there's a lot of people that pull onto the freeway without even looking behind them. And they don't yield for other cars. And that's a good way to get run over by a semi-truck, is by not yielding. It's our responsibility, our duty, our obligation to God to yield to Him all the time. When the Holy Spirit works in your heart and in your conscience to do something, to give something up, to start doing something, whatever He's telling you to do, it is we're under obligation to him because he's the Lord of our lives. He owns your life. You belong to him. He's the master. You're under obligation to yield to him. God, do I go this direction? Which direction do I go? Is this the proper way to act in this situation? What do you want me to do here? What kind of things do you want me involved in? What direction do you want me to go in ministry in my life? We yield to God. We just don't come up with our own plan, but we yield to him. 
What is being filled with the Spirit? Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 18 is the main verse, but I want you to start in verse 15 with me because we need to understand the context. The context under, helps us understand this verse of being filled with the Spirit. He says in verse 15, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord of the will is, what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. So verse 18, it says, do not get drunk with wine. And just as a side note, let's make that perfectly clear. That's a direct command to every believer. We're not supposed to be drunk with alcohol. We're not supposed to be under the influence, under the control of alcohol. This is one of the main reasons why. When you're under control of a, when you're under control of a liquid substance, you're no longer under the control of God's will. The Holy Spirit demands and requires total control of yourself in order to experience these things the Lord wants us to experience in our lives. So it says, do not be drunk with wine, or do not be controlled with wine. That's what it's literally saying. Don't be controlled by wine. Christians aren't supposed to be controlled by anything except the Lord. It's not just wine, but it's anything. If anything has a controlling influence in your life, you are not being filled by the Spirit. You've given something else lordship in your life. But he particularly points out alcohol in this verse as an illustration of what the Holy Spirit does. When you're filled with alcohol, the alcohol is what controls you. You're not in control of yourself anymore. You've given it up to a liquid beverage with sometimes horrible consequences. But he says, likewise, the Holy Spirit is, he wants to fill you. He wants to control you. This is a control that's good. This is the control that God demands. He says, be filled, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So in the same way, alcohol can control your mind, your life, your body. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit wants us to be under His control, to be filled with Him. Someone once uh, was speaking to a, a class of Bible students and he held a, a glass of, uh, a, a, just an empty glass up. He asked the class, how, how do you get all the air out of this cup, out of this glass? And one of the students, he said, you suck it out with a vacuum. And he said, well, the, the glass would still be empty, though. And then he took a pitcher, and, and he put the glass down, and he filled that pitcher, that he filled that glass up with the water. And he said, I just filled this glass up, and now there's no air in it. This is the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. See, what our problem is that sometimes Christians is we like, we, we try to just suck out a little bit of sin in here and there. You know, God points something out to us and we try to work on that thing. We see a character flaw, maybe we'll try to fix it. And that's not necessarily the most effective way of dealing with sin in our life. Instead of sucking sin out here and there, I think what the Bible teaches us is to be filled with the Spirit. Because if you allow the Holy Spirit to fill your life up, to fill your heart up, to be under His control, all, all the other stuff's going to go out automatically. You see, you can't be controlled by two things. It's one thing or the other. You're either under control of your flesh or you're under control of the Holy Spirit. So being filled means to be controlled. And I want you to look at some things in this passage, the surrounding passage also, talks about this control, this filling of the Spirit. First of all, I want you to know that it is God's will for you to be filled with the Spirit. In verse 17, it says, be, But understand what the, Lord, the will of the Lord is. God has a will, a plan for you. He has a plan for you. If you're in here and you're saved, if you're a born-again believer, and Jesus Christ saved you from your sins and, and you're on your way to heaven, that's not where it stops. He is a rightful Lord of your life, and He has a plan for you. He knows you specifically. 
The Bible tells us that God even has every hair on your head numbered. He knows you intimately, specifically, and he loves you. And he has a plan for your life. He wants to use you in this world to carry out his purposes. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a missionary to carry out God's purposes. It's just whatever God's will is for you, that's what his purpose is for you. And he has a will for you. You need to understand that. And part of his will is for you to be filled with the Spirit. It is his desire for you to be filled with this, the Spirit, to experience this power that the Bible talks about. There's a lot of things that come along with being filled with the Spirit. In fact, every aspect of the Christian life is completed by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. <coughs> Watch what it says here. It says in verse 15, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Part of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that the Lord gives us wisdom in how to walk, to walk wisely and carefully. It's impossible for you to understand what decisions to make in this life apart from the Lord because He's the one that knows everything. He sees the future. He sees the past. He's in all of it at the same time. He knows everything. He's, he's completely omniscient. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. And so when the Holy Spirit leads and directs and guides you, He will guide you to the right place every time. Even though it might not seem like it at the time, if you know you're obeying God, you're in the right place. The Holy Spirit causes us to walk wisely and carefully. Another thing the Holy Spirit does is He causes us not to waste our lives. Look at what it says in verse 16. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. We live in evil days today. There's evil all around. The evil is trying to overcome good. Evil is trying to overcome the Lord's work. The Bible says that Jesus Christ has the victory. We have the victory in Christ. But he says because the time is evil, we need to make the most of it. The time is evil and the devil's trying to accomplish his will. God's trying to accomplish his will. We know God wins. But there's a battle going on down here right now. And if you're not acutely aware of it and, it, and purposely submitting yourself to God's will and saying, God, I want you to do with me whatever you want. I know there's a battle down here. I'm your soldier. Send me out to do whatever. If you don't have that kind of mindset, you can live your whole life and completely waste it. He wants us to make the most of our time. Don't waste time in these evil days. Walking in the Spirit allows us to be usable by God. We want to walk wisely and carefully, not waste our lives, and also to overcome evil. Because these days are evil. The next point on your outline there is to understand God's will. In verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You can't know what God desires for you, which direction He wants you to go. How do you know God wants you to do a certain thing? When you come to a serious decision point in your life, how are you supposed to discern what the Lord wants you to do? The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us in accordance with His Word, oftentimes speaking through circumstances also. But the Holy Spirit leads and guides those who follow Him. If you're walking close with God, if you're walking in fellowship with Him, the Holy Spirit has a way to speak to you. He has a way to speak to you. Again, He doesn't speak against what the, what the Word says. He speaks to you in accordance with God's will, in accordance with what the Bible says. But if you're walking in the Spirit, you'll understand His voice. You'll understand when God is telling you something on the inside. If you didn't experience that when you got saved, I would say you probably didn't get saved. Because it's the Holy Spirit that draws you, that brings conviction of your sin, that tells you you need to come to Christ. That what this guy is telling you about salvation and Jesus Christ is true. You need to say yes to it. The Holy Spirit teaches you in that moment. But the Holy Spirit doesn't leave you there. That's just the beginning. Some people start there, but then they don't go and continue in the things that God wants them to do. Listen, this passage teaches that being filled results in joy-filled living. Joy-filled living. Look at verse 19. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Have you ever been in a horrible mood and someone comes by whistling and you just want to slap them in the face? Will you just shut up 
right? Wouldn't you like to be that person instead of the person that's mad all the time? Listen, the Holy Spirit desires for you to be filled with joy, even in the middle of turmoil, even in the middle of trouble. There's something that we have as believers that the world definitely does not have. God desires you to be filled with joy, peace. These are fruits of the Spirit. We're going to go over that passage in a minute. But God wants you filled with those things. The Holy Spirit produces these things in your life. Joy-filled living. You have invincible joy, Jesus talked about. Invincible joy, imagine that. There's no trouble in this world that's more important than who He is. And if you have Him, there's nothing you can go through in this life that can wreck that. Sometimes we need our focus readjusted, though, don't we? We need our focus readjusted. Because none of us are perfect. We get our feet dirty in this world as believers. But God gets our eyes back on Him so that we can be joy-filled again. Listen, being filled with the Holy Spirit results in humility and, and submission too. Listen in verse 20. It says, always giving thanks. This is a result of being filled with the Spirit. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Be subjected to one another in the fear of Christ. So we, we, we're subjected to one another as believers. There's a humility there. We don't try to step on each other to get up higher. We don't put uh, ourselves above other people. The, the whole spirit of the body of Christ should, should be that we're in submission to one another. That we put the needs of other people first. That's what love is. Right? So if you're living a selfish life, if you're trying to hurt people, that's not what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. You live in contrary to God's will. He desires for us. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it fills you with, with humility. You have a, a desire to put yourself under people and, and to be their servants. That's what Jesus said, that the greatest among you is going to be your servant. When the, when the disciples were arguing about who's going to sit at, at, at his right hand. He said, I want to be first. God, I want to be first. No, I want to be first. He said, no, you don't even understand what the kingdom is about. You're completely backwards. You're thinking like the world. The greatest among you is going to be your servant. That takes humility. When the Holy Spirit fills us up, we don't battle with all these kind of interpersonal thoughts inside of our heads and, and who's best and who's number one. It's humility. I want to be a servant to other people. I want to show Christ to them so that they can know Christ and walk with Him. Another result is submission to Christ. He says, out of fear of Christ. Listen, one of the things that happened in the book of Acts when the church was filled with the Holy Spirit, there was a sense of awe in the room. There was a sense of awe. Everyone had a sense of wonder whenever the disciples preached. There was a sense of awe. There was fear of God. They knew God's doing something. I just can't sit here anymore. I just can't continue to live the same way. Something new is here. Something different is here. Something real is here. God's doing something. I better get right with God. There was a fear and awe of God. And that's a rightful fear, a rightful awe. The Bible talks about a holy kind of fear that we need to live before God. We walk in the Spirit. That's one of the results. Listen, I want you to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 now. Ephesians talks about filling in the Spirit. and Galatians talks about walking in the Spirit. And they're very similar. In fact, it's the same thing. Walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. It's the same idea. I believe Paul throughout the scriptures uh, brings up this idea in many different, different ways. And another way in Colossians he talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new. I believe that's just a description of walking in the spirit. We're going through uh, a small group study in our small groups here at our church. Uh, Henry Blackaby is experiencing God. And his whole description of what the Christian life was like is really just a description, a, a step-by-step Instructions of walking in the Spirit. How do you quit living a self-centered life and live a God-centered life? And he, he speaks specifically about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And this passage talks about those same things. Start in verse 14 in Galatians. It says, And that which was a trial to you... Oh, I'm in the wrong pa- chapter, sorry. Chapter 5. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word... And the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let that sink in. One of our purposes, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole law. Now watch what he says here. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. 
So here's the greatest command, love one another. All right, that's the law of Christ. The opposite is biting and devouring one another. That is the opposite of, of loving your neighbor. He says, instead of biting and devouring one another, here's the opposite. He says, but I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, and listen carefully, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a list of all the things he saved us from. Do you see what he's talking about here? These are a list of all the reasons why Jesus had to die for me. Because these things were me. <coughs> these are the things that were inside of me. He says, if you're a believer, you cannot be under these things. You can't keep living by the flesh. You have to be led by the Spirit. Living that way means that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I believe the insinuation there is, is that if you're a Christian, there's going to necessarily be a change in your life after you get saved. You can't stay the same. If you stayed the same after your salvation decision, I would really seriously consider reviewing what you really did and whether or not you really did get saved. Because you can't stay unsaved or you can't stay unchanged after you've been saved. But in verse 22, and listen, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Walking in the Spirit has much to do with our personal behavior, our personal character, and how we treat other people. If the whole law is summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself, and it's the Holy Spirit that gives us love and joy and peace and helps us overcome all these sins of the flesh, then it's impossible, it's impossible to have relationships down here according to God's will without being filled with the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit, on your blank, on, under number C, the Holy Spirit enables us to overcome self-centered living and fulfill the law of Christ. He helps us overcome self-centered living. It's very natural. In fact, it's our instinct, our first instinct as humans, to be self-centered, to protect ourselves, to put ourselves first. That's natural. But the Bible says if you're a Christian, you've crucified your flesh, you've become something different. You've become a new creature. You have something new inside of you that's not flesh, something new inside of you that you need to begin following. The Bible says that if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, but your flesh is still there. It's not eradicated. Why is that? Well, you're still in your body. We still live in this sinful body. In heaven, you're going to have a glorified body. There's going to be no sin. It's going to be totally eradicated. You're going to be saved completely from the presence of sin. Saved from the presence of sin. It's not even going to be present in your body. It's not going to be present in your mind. Here on earth, you are not free from the presence of sin yet. You, however, can be. Listen, you and I can be free from the power of sin. Jesus Christ saved us, died to save us from the penalty of sin, and so that we can live free from the power of sin. And so we have these two things inside of us, the spirit and the flesh. And walking in the Spirit helps us to quit being self-centered and fulfill the law, the law of Christ, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, there are two apparent paths for the believer in the Scriptures. This is all throughout the New Testament described in many different ways. There's life led by the flesh, and there's life led by the Spirit. There is no in-between in the biblical description of the Christian life. I know that's my alarm, but I, I'm still going. There's two roads, okay? There's no neutral. 
in the Christian life is what you need to understand. Okay? You can't just be a church person. All right? There's either I'm, I'm, I'm living in the flesh or I'm walking in the spirit. It's either or. If you're not walking in the spirit, you're not pleasing God. You're not obeying God. You're not fulfilling the law of Christ. Our part in being filled is to choose obedience to His leading. We choose obedience to His leading. When the Holy Spirit works in you, then you listen to Him. If the Holy Spirit convicts your heart of a sin, you repent from it immediately. When the Holy Spirit opens your eye up to a character flaw, you allow Him to work on you. When the Holy Spirit gives you direction to start doing something for Him, you take steps and you do it. So this is a weird command. I know I think I've explained this on a Wednesday night before. The, the command to walk in the Spirit. We kind of understand walking, right? You, you take one step at a time. One foot in front of another. And if you do that enough times, you, you'll get to your destination eventually, right? That's what walking in the Spirit is. He doesn't show you the whole map of your life from the beginning of your life. You, you wouldn't even go in that direction if God did that. Okay? You, you, you need to understand that walking in the Spirit is one step at a time. When the Holy Spirit tells you one thing, you obey immediately. And if you obey immediately, God tells you the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And when you say no, that's when it stops. As soon as you say no, God, I'm not doing that. That's when you get out of step with the Spirit. And you're not following Christ as Lord anymore. You're following yourself and being self-centered. That's why there's a, there's a tension in the Christian life. In our small group studies, I believe Blackaby calls this the, the crisis of faith. Right? There's a crisis of faith. When God tells you to do something, you have a crisis of faith, and you've got to decide whether or not you're really going to believe what God says and have faith in Him and, and obey what He says or, or go your own way. See, every step is a crisis of faith. Am I going to obey what God tells me? But you'll never understand what God wants to do in your life unless you walk in the Spirit, unless you obey each step. Don't say no to God. Don't stop His work in your life. Don't stop it. The other command, be filled with the Spirit. How do you be filled? Do you sit there and, and just say, be filled? How do you be? That's a weird command. How, how do you do that? If I just looked at you and said, be filled, what do you do? There's an assumption in this passage, which is really awesome, and you need to understand this. There's an assumption that someone's trying to fill you. Okay? You can't just be filled by yourself. Someone has to be trying to do the filling, right? right? Why? Because God's always working in your life to make you more like Christ and to do something with your life. He wants you to be following Him and to be filled with Him and to be blessed by Him. And He's always working. Right? It's never us that takes a step towards God. He's always the one that starts the work. He's always the one that initi initiates it. Okay? He's the one that initiates it. Your job is to respond. Be filled. Let him fill you. Let God fill your life. And when he says something to you, when he tells you to take a step, let him fill you up. It's either that or live your life walking in the flesh. And the Bible tells us very clearly what the consequences of that are. Both these two paths, walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit, have different consequences. They have a different end game. All right? There's a different end game. Do not, do not be deceived. A man reaps what he sows. You can reap to the flesh, or you can reap to the spirit. Romans 8 teaches that. All you got to do is look around at people you know personally and see examples of that all over the place. Just look around. Seeing people living by the flesh and what it results. What's the end game of their lives? It's not something you want to follow. Listen, here's results of being filled. Some results of being filled. The first thing is Christ-like character. Now I want you to write beside that, sanctification. Sanctification. Another big theology word. It just means that the Holy Spirit is working in you all the time to sanctify you, to cause you to be set apart from sin and from this world and be set apart to God. It's a two-part thing. I'm set apart from sin and from the world and to God. A two-step pro two process, and they, they, work, they go hand in hand. And, and you can't have one side without the other. It's impossible. But the Holy Spirit is always working in your life to sanctify you, to purify you. Okay, now watch. You have the position 
of being totally righteous before God. We understand that's what justification is. Okay? But you, in your practical living, are not completely righteous. You're not. Some churches teach that. You're completely righteous. But once you get saved, oh, then you have a second experience of the Holy Spirit. And they give it some, there's all kinds of different names some churches give it. And then they say, you don't ever sin after that. What a, oh, oh, oh man. Well, if you were a Christian and, and, and you were under a teaching like that, wouldn't you be scared to death? There are people that pretend that they live a life with no sin. To pre- pretend that they're way more righteous than what they really are. Right? If you're not perfect, you, 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 you go to hell. You lose the Holy Spirit. Because they don't understand what the Bible teaches about baptism and about filling. That's not how salvation works. I'm so glad it doesn't. Okay? But the Holy Spirit is trying to fill us so that he can sanctify us. He wants to purify you. You have a position of total righteousness. That means he's declared you innocent and sinless. But in our practical lives, the Holy Spirit is trying to sanctify us. Okay? Sanctific- sanctification is a process where he's trying to clean your life up. He's trying to get you to turn away from sin in your life, to repent from sin. You can't just keep hanging on to sin and expecting God to use you, expecting God to bless you, expecting God to give you good things, expecting God to give you directions. You can't do it because you're disobeying his work of sanctification. If you know a sin you're hanging on to in your life that you keep going back to over and over and over, you need to do some business with God. Because you're out of step with him. You're never going to hear from him until you take care of that thing you know needs taken care of. Why is the Holy Spirit going to give you direction in your life if you're disobeying something you know he's telling you? If you see something in the word and your life is is going against that word and you're, you're disobeying something and you know you're committing sin, why do you think God's going to do anything in your life? You're obeying something he explicitly says. There's no direction. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. But you're outside of his blessing. You're outside of his fellowship. You're not walking in the spirit anymore. Listen, God wants you to be cleaned. He wants you to be close to him. All of these things come by obeying the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't allow sin to reside in our hearts and our minds. Intentional sin, he doesn't allow that. He doesn't allow that. We're outside of his will. We're outside of what he wants for us when we're doing that. We need to allow him to sanctify us. That's one of the results of being filled with the Spirit. Christ-like character. We all have a lot of things the Holy Spirit needs to work on. The way you walk in the Spirit is you let him do it. Let him do it. Has he showed you something in your life? Has he opened your eyes to something? Maybe he doesn't need to show you. You just know it. Why are you going to continue to disobey? Why continue to walk outside of all of these things God wants for you? You're hanging on to trash, and God's offering you the world. That's foolish. Hanging on to sin. Sin is dumb. It's stupid. Because it's something that steals all the best from us. Listen, a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit is usefulness to God. Usefulness to God. God desires for you to be useful to Him. He has a mission for you. He has a plan. He wants you to be useful in his hands. We become useful when we're under his control. Where we say, here I, here I am, God. I'm your servant. Whatever you speak, I'm going to do it. Wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to go. Wherever you tell me to go to, I'm going to go to. Whatever I have to do to love somebody, I'm going to do it. You submit to him and say, God, I want to be used by you. Here's my life. Take it. The next thing is this, is witnessing. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit doesn't work in our lives just for our own benefit. Walking in the Spirit certainly does benefit your life. But His work in your life is not in order to glorify you. God works in your life and blesses your life in order for Jesus to be glorified. In fact, the Holy Spirit does these things in order to put a spotlight on Christ. Our living, the way we live as Christians, as as a church, as church members here at First Baptist, is either a, a, a bad testimony or it's a spotlight on Christ. How we walk and live and and love each other can be a spotlight 
The Holy Spirit uses us to put a spotlight on Him. And that's one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see the Holy Spirit working in the book of Acts, you see people sharing the gospel with other people. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Jesus is saying this to the disciples right before his ascension. Right before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit first baptized believers, you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has control of your life, you have power to be His witnesses, power to testify for Him, power to tell people about the wondrous works that God's done inside of you. God requires us as believers because He died to save you, to go and tell other people how they can be saved too. We have a duty and an obligation out of God's love for us and out of our love for their people. Listen, First Baptist, we can't say we love people and, and just sit on the gospel. You can't say you care about people in this town. You can't say you care about your family members or your friends if you don't share the gospel with them. You know what? Not sharing the gospel with them is like saying, it's like telling them, go to hell. Really, what's the difference? Why wouldn't you just say that? If you know how to get to heaven, and you don't tell people who aren't going, there's something seriously wrong in your relationship with God. Would you tell someone to their face, go to hell and mean it? But people say that flippantly. No Christian should ever say that, ever, to anyone. Not when you're, not when you're mad. I don't care what anyone does. That's the worst thing you can possibly ever say to anybody. Go to hell. When you don't share the gospel with somebody, why not say that? Wouldn't it be the same thing? He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 8 and watch this. I love this. Here's a perfect example. This is a great example of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives in witnessing. This is an example of a one-on-one witnessing encounter. Has the Holy Spirit ever led you to share the gospel with somebody before? Listen, if you're walking in the Spirit, God's going to give you opportunities. He's going to give you urgings to go to certain people and share the gospel. You're going to look for opportunities and keep your eyes open. (coughs) Next, chapter 8, verse 26. It says, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he went up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official, of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Listen, doesn't God know everything? Guys, there are people all around us that are ready to be saved. They're ready for Christ. They're ready to have God in their lives. But there are people going to him. That's why the Bible says that the harvest is ready. But the, the workers are few. There's no people out there doing the work. I'm so glad there was a pastor who was just doing random visits. And he visited my mom when I was 13 years old in our backyard. And I remember watching as he sat, him and someone else from the church sat and and talked to my mom about Jesus Christ and about how to be saved. And and she got saved when he did that because he was obeying the Holy Spirit and, and witnessing to people. And the Holy Spirit will give you specific opportunities to share the gospel with people. First, an angel of the Lord told Philip to go to this direction. He says, get up and go south to that road. That's as specific as he got. Just get up and go. What did Philip say? Well, where exactly do you want me to go? Do I take it right here on the road or left there on the road? No, he just said go south. Philip got up and what did he do? He obeyed. Do you see that? He didn't know the whole picture. He obeyed. And then watch what happened. There was this Ethiopian sitting there and he was reading the Bible. He was reading the Bible. This guy, he wasn't even a Jew. But he had the scriptures in his hand. Isaiah. And the watch of verse 29. Pay attention. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Oh, Philip knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what was going on. Why? Because Jesus just told them that you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. You'll be my witnesses. Philip knew what God's agenda was. Church... 
God's agenda is the same for us today, right here. This is his agenda for us. This is carrying out exactly what Philip was carrying out in this passage. He says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. And Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? Well, how convenient. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the passage said, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he does not open his mouth. And then verse 34, the eunuch said to Philip, Please tell me of whom does this speak of himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth. The beginning from the script, this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. See, the Holy Spirit led him to this person. And Philip found out where he was at spiritually. And Philip started with that person right where he was at. And what did he do? He preached Jesus to him from where that person was at. And that's our job right here in this town. To go right to people right where they're at in their life, wherever it's at. Wherever it's at. Now, no matter how low you think that person is, it doesn't matter. You meet them where they're at and you preach Christ to them. That's what Philip did. And this eunuch believed in Christ. And he said, shouldn't I get baptized? He said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And listen, verse 37, that's what Philip said. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's a witnessing opportunity. The Holy Spirit leads us in sharing Christ with other people. So, in closing, what do we do? What do we do? There's three things in response to this this truth about being filled with the Spirit. The first thing is that we need to have expectant faith. We need to have an expectant faith. Jesus told the disciples to go and wait. To go and wait. That they were going to be filled with the Spirit. They didn't even understand really what that meant. But listen, they went into that room and they got together and they prayed and they sang. And they waited. There was an expectancy. They knew that God was going to fulfill His promise. Let me ask you a question today. Do you believe all these things are true? They're in the Bible. To have a a life that's filled with love and joy and peace and patience and power? To have a fellowship with God? Do you really believe that? Do you believe with all of your heart? Do you you expect that that's exactly what God wants to give you in your life? Because it is. He tells you. You can't deny it. He's not a liar. Do you expect that that's what God... I believe to walk, to to, to be filled with the Spirit, there needs to be an expectation that God's going to keep His Word. The next thing is this, is persistence. Persistence. Expect seeking, expectant seeking persistence. Listen to Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 13. Jesus Christ is talking about prayer. To, be, to experience this filling of the Spirit, we need to seek Him. He says in verse 5, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend. And he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come from a journey, and I have nothing set before him. And from inside he says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up now and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not give up and give him anything because he's a friend, yet because of his persistence he will give up and give him as much as he needs. He's saying this guy who doesn't want to loan to his friend is a jerk. He's not going to give anything to his friend, but because his friend keeps bothering him, he doesn't want to be pestered. So he's going to give the man what he wants to get him off of his lawn. That's not a very cheerful giving situation, is it? But he's he's teaching something here. He's saying it's the persistence. He says, I say to you, verse 9, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. You know, this passage is often used as a salvation verse. And I suppose there might be some application there. But I believe he's talking about something else. In verse 3 he says, For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish, or one of you fathers. Will he give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he is asked for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion? 
If you then, being evil, listen, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He's specifically talking about us seeking the work and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He desires you to seek, to ask, to go after God. What's it take? You need to believe He's there. You need to believe His promises. And you need to seek and seek and seek and seek until He gives it to you. The next thing is this, is Immediate and continued obedience. When you seek after God, and He lets you experience being filled with the Holy Spirit, which is what He wants in your life, you need to respond to Him. Whatever He does, however He changes your life, whatever kind of crisis of faith you have to go to, are you willing to obey Him? I want you to bow your heads for a minute and close your eyes. Charles Finney wrote about being filled with the Spirit in his life. He said, He had mighty infillings of the Holy Spirit that went through me as it seemed body and soul. I immediately found myself endued with such power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were the means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows in the souls of men. They cut like a sword and they broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes can attest to this. Sometimes I would find myself in a great measure empty of this power. And I would go and visit and find that I made no saving impression. I would, I would exhort and pray with the same results. And I would set a day apart for private fasting and prayer after humbling myself and crying out for help. And this power would return upon me with all of its freshness. This has been the experience of my life. Many, many Christians throughout time have written of this experience of being filled with the Spirit, of walking in the Spirit. Didn't it become weird? Or swing from chandeliers or make weird noises in church? They, they became righteous in their living. They became powerful instruments of God right where they were at. That, that is the, the sign of the Spirit, the sign of being filled with Him. Christian, let me ask you, maybe all this is new to you. Maybe you don't feel like you're filled with the Spirit right now. My invitation today is to do exactly what Jesus did wherever you're at. If you realize that there's an emptiness, there's a lacking in your, in your faith, in your walk with God. You want a closeness. You want a reality. It starts when we submit ourselves and yield to the Holy Spirit in our lives. To let Him have His work in you. Whatever sin is holding you back, whatever inaction is keeping you from obeying God, respond to Him today. Respond to Him. The world has not yet seen what God can do through one person who's given Himself completely over to the Holy Spirit. Moody took God up on that invitation. Wouldn't it be great for our church to do the same? Dear God, I pray right now as we go into this invitation time that you would speak to our hearts. Help us obey you to do whatever you would have us do. Help us to respond, God, to your work in our hearts. God, I thank you so much for these great and precious promises that we would not ignore this essential aspect of our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand.